Welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, this afternoon, we will begin a more intensive exploration of these topics, with the first one being perception. And uh, we have with us to guide us through uh, Pavan Sinha, who is a professor of brain and cognitive sciences at MIT uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Pavan uh, is one of the world's experts on visual perception, and uh, he is going to share with us a really remarkable project, much of which is actually being conducted here in India. Uh, and uh, it has very basic scientific implications, and it also has profound humanitarian implications. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Pavan. Thank you very much, Richie. Um, let me start by saying that in being here, I'm honored many times over. First and foremost, Your Holiness, I'm honored just to be in your presence. Uh, your words and wisdom have influenced and inspired me as they've done mil millions of other people. So it's truly a privilege for me to, to meet you. I'm honored to be in this August setting in this amazing uh, monastery in the midst of this distinguished monastic gathering. And I'm honored to be part of such a distinguished group of scientists to relay to you the excitement that we feel about modern science and to understand through this dialogue how we might together improve the human condition by pooling all of our knowledge. I would be remiss if I were not to thank Richie once again for inviting me to, to this wonderful gathering. I also wanted to thank Wendy Hassenkoff and Liza Katz and Ned Dunn, who have done so much work to make sure that this meeting runs as smoothly as it has already been running and we all hope will continue to run over the next few days. Um, so in thinking about how to prepare for this meeting, and also specifically how to start my talk so that it would be somewhat appropriate for this setting, I was pleasantly surprised to discover that the very first precept of the Buddha's Eightfold Noble Path is right view or right seeing. Now, what does that mean? Of course, I'm not a scholar of Buddhist thought, but this is what I gather it means. Right seeing reveals the world in its true state, and through this process, wisdom or knowledge emerges. Why do I bring this up? I bring this up because the process of this emergence of knowledge, that is one of the most fundamental questions of modern neuroscience. I could say it another way, the question that all of us in neuroscience would love to understand is this, how does the brain learn to see? So how do we organize our very complex visual sensorium into something more meaningful, into a world of objects and even concepts, a word that has been used quite often this morning? But this is a question that has been very difficult to address experimentally, because almost the only technique we have for... No. So almost the only experimental technique that we have to address this question is to work with newborns, creatures who are going through this process after they are born. Now, these could be human newborns or they could be non-human newborns. But these are not very good experimental subjects. Um, a human newborn, as 
some of us uh, have experienced firsthand, like to sleep most of the time. So when I had my son, I was surprised to find that he was sleeping 18 or 19 hours every day. And even when he was... And they also have difficulties understanding what we would want them to do in an experiment and responding appropriately. So our temptation as experimentalists would be to wait for several months until the baby is old enough to barely understand what we want them to do and until they're old enough to respond appropriately. But the problem with waiting is that vision develops very rapidly. In a matter of a few months, you have a baby who has already progressed to being a very sophisticated observer. Um, and in fact, this is again something that many of us have seen firsthand. Very young babies <laughs> are very sophisticated. <laughs> so, by waiting even for a few months, we are already missing out on a lot of the learning process that we would like to study. So that brings us back to square one. How do we study this question of how the brain learns to see? And what I want to share with you today is an opportunity my students and I have had to make some headway on this question. It's a scientific opportunity, but as Richie mentioned, we are also in the fortunate position of making a positive impact on society as we pursue uh, this project. So it's a merger of a humanitarian quest and a scientific investigation. So let me first start by describing what is the humanitarian need that we are addressing through this project. And that humanitarian need is nicely encapsulated in this one fact one in every hundred Indians is blind. India has the world's largest population of blind individuals. And there are many factors for that. But even if you were to look at just childhood blindness, it turns out that the incidence of childhood blindness in India is at least three times as high as it is in the West. So the number of children being born blind, say for every 1,000 births, live, live births, that's three times as high in India as it is in the US or in Europe. What are the causes? So far, any research, what are the causes? Yeah, so next slide. Um, <laughs> so these are some of the causes <clears throat> of childhood blindness in India. So on the left, you see a child with corneal opacities uh, so unlike our eyes, which have these beautifully clear corneas, the outer surface of the cornea, you see that the child on the left has opaque corneas. On the right, you see a case of cataracts. So most of us, when we think of cataracts, we think of age-related cataracts, that once you grow to a certain age, then you have a likelihood of developing cataracts. But it turns out that children can be born with cataracts. And Your Holiness, to your question, what might be causing uh, childhood cataracts, uh, the last factor that I've listed there, congenital rubella, so that's one of the primary factors. And the rubella is another story. The gynecology, sir. So, and the gynecology, and the gynecology, and If the mother, while she's pregnant, during the first trimester of a pregnancy, if she gets rubella, then it's very likely that the child will be born blind. And the proportion of India's population that's vaccinated against rubella is still very small. So unlike... 
Unlike in the US, where uh, the rate of vaccination for rubella is almost 100%, in India it's very small. Um, and there are various other conditions that cause childhood blindness. Considering all of these causes, it turns out that a fairly large proportion of these children have either treatable or preventable blindness. So over 40% of all children have avoidable blindness. But most of these children are destined to take their blindness to their graves. Um, and the, the reasons for them not being treated, they're many fold. Uh, many of these children live in remote villages, so they don't have access to medical facilities. They might not even know that the treat condition is treatable, or they simply might not have money to get to a hospital and get the child treated. <coughs> so the bottom line is that a very large proportion of these children are living with blindness and they're living terrible lives. Um, here are some of the consequences of blindness for a blind child in India. The lifespan of a blind child in India is on average 15 years shorter than that of a sighted one. And that's for the lucky ones who make it past the first few years alive. Fewer than half of all children born blind live to see their fifth birthday. Half of the, the blind children die within the first five years. Less than 10% of the blind children get any kind of education, and a vanishingly small proportion are employed as adults. So clearly, there's a humanitarian crisis that needs to be addressed. And that's the humanitarian need that our project seeks to fulfill. We want to provide treatment to all children who are curably blind. A child like this boy who has cataracts, and we in the medical community certainly know how to treat cataracts. It, it's morally imperative for us to find these children and provide them treatment. But luckily for us as scientists, in meeting this humanitarian need, we also have the opportunity, an unprecedented scientific opportunity, to study how vision develops <clears throat> after the child is treated. So you can imagine, if you have a 10-year-old boy like this, who has treatable blindness, in a matter of half an hour, through surgery, you're able to bring him sight. From the very moment that the bandages are opened, you have a ringside seat into the process of visual development. Negative addition. That then the um, that then we both okay. Lebe, you lebe one she can just get to you met. Make sure that she can just get to you met. That that she check up she or what. Then that then they cover up some bush bush doors. Book chun chun ya get it to say yomar what. That book that the lot you you don't let any the get you ne make sure long way in the budget. Men choose che che me che to be na. That call get it to che. So this combination of the pressing humanitarian need and the amazing scientific opportunity it presents, this is what I meant by saying that these two things are in perfect complementarity. The scientific funds that we can get as researchers, they would go towards the treatment of children, and the observations that we make about the children's visual development, those advance science. So it's a very <coughs> virtuous circle where one side benefits the other. And seeing this perfect synergy between the two sides, about 10 years ago, we launched Project Prakash. Prakash, as I'm sure all of you know, is Sanskrit for light, and the idea is that in bringing light into the lives of blind children, we also have an opportunity to illuminate some of the deep questions of science. So Project Prakash, just in broad outlines, <coughs> it's set up as a three-part effort. The first and logistically most complex part is outreach. 
simply identifying who are the children who are candidates for treatment. So we cannot wait for these children to show up at the hospital. Rather, we have to proactively go out and find these children. So teams of our healthcare workers go deep into the Gangetic Plain, uh, deep into Rajasthan, into Madhya Pradesh, to find these children, conduct screening camps to identify these children. And I have a little video of one of these outreach sessions. <clears throat> So, Generally speaking, South Indian, North Indian. Do you want to pause that? Uh, let me pause it. Yeah. Um, so we have mostly confined our work to North India so far, um, just because we are limited by resources. But I don't expect that there would be a very big difference between the North and the South. There would be or won't be? There won't be. There will be. not be okay. a big difference. You get a thing in the do you want to mention your surgical facilities are in the north? So. Yeah, the surgical facilities are all in New Delhi. Um, so that's part of the reason why we have confined our work. The major is the New Delhi mother map in the Koyulia. They put their own to go there and they will be on my Islam. So this screening camp was conducted. Uh, in a, in a town close to Allahabad in the Gangetic Plains. Um, we were going there soon after the monsoons and hence you see the water on the roads. So during the screening, we are conducting some very simple tests to assess what's the status of the eye. Is the child potentially treatable? Uh, is the child sensitive to light? Because if the child does not even have light sensitivity, then it's unlikely that the condition is treatable. So we are asking the little girl to point to where the light is. So one of the things we are able to do through these outreach camps is provide preventive care. Even children who are not currently blind but are at risk of going blind, we can provide them care right then. We are also able to provide children with low vision aids, people who are partially sighted, children who are partially sighted. We can give them optical aids. And of course, we are able to identify children who have treatable blindness. So like this boy, uh, and you will see the cataracts in his, in his eyes. So once we identify these children who are potentially treatable, we have them come to New Delhi, and as Richie pointed out, our, uh, our surgical care facilities are of world-class quality, and they are in New Delhi. Um, here is a little video of a pediatric surgery. So the little girl has just been given general anesthesia, and she's about to go under. So you notice the big cataract in the eye. The surgeon will remove the cataract um, and then replace it with a plastic lens, an acrylic lens that's being implanted now. And now here's a boy for whom this is the first day 
of bandage opening. His left eye has not been treated at the time the video was made. And the little bit of bleeding on the side of the eye is nothing to be concerned about, that clears up. So the, the question is, what is this child experiencing in this first moment of sight? And how will his vision change over time? And that's precisely where research comes in, to understand how vision develops after the onset of sight. But even before we can get to this exciting question of how vision develops, we have to seriously consider whether vision is going to develop at all. Um, given that these are fairly old children, would their brain be plastic enough, be changeable enough, in order to be able to adapt to this information that the eyes have now begun to provide it? So there's the question of brain plasticity, and there's also the question of behavior. Would the child actually benefit from ophthalmic treatment so late in life. It could be at eight years, it could be at 22 years. The oldest we have treated is 29 years. So we need to find out whether this is actually beneficial. The reason we have to ask these questions, and the reason actually to be somewhat pessimistic about the answers to these questions, is this very rich body of work on critical periods in development. Um, so many wonderful researchers have looked at the consequences of visual deprivation early in life, and what they have reported is that deprivation early in life has permanent and severe effects for the rest of one's life. And that has led to the notion that uh, visual input during a critical window early on in life is necessary for vision to develop. That would suggest that if we are treating a child who's say 15 years old, then we're coming to the game too late. Um, because these studies pointed out that even a few months of deprivation early in life would be disastrous. So if we are treating a 15-year-old child, then maybe we are not doing them any favors, maybe they will not benefit. Yeah. I actually want to point out the work of David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, um, who won the Nobel Prize in 1981, for the beautiful studies of the consequences of visual deprivation. So these are all amazing experiments. But we have to be very careful in extrapolating these results to human children, because all of these studies have been done with non-human subjects. <laughs> So typically with mice or with kittens, a few with monkeys, but none with humans. So there are basic questions about human brain plasticity that still remain open. And we really need data directly from human subjects if we are to settle those questions. And Project Prakash has begun to provide some of those uh, answers, or at least some of the data. So uh, I want to share with you some of the vignettes of the kinds of results we are finding with uh, the Project Prakash children. The first set of results that I want to, to mention are those that we've obtained with functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, fMRI. Uh, this is a wonderful technique 
that allows you to not only image the structure of the brain, but also which parts of the brain are active at any given time. So you get a functional picture of the brain. So when we image the Prakash children uh, with fMRI, what do we see? Do we see any evidence of change in the brains of the Prakash children? Is there plasticity? And indeed, there is. I'm not going to go into the details of, of the techniques that we've used here or the analysis that we've done. But what I want you to take away from this is the fact that there are three or four time points that are shown here. Um, two days prior to surgery. Time two is one week after surgery. Time three is a month after surgery. And time four is four months after surgery. Yeah. Yeah. And what you're seeing here is a flattened image of the cortex, of the brain. And in the yellow and red splotches, you're seeing activation. Mom, and what you, see, uh, what you see, even at a glance, is that the brain of this 20-year-old subject this is a 20-year-old patient, really blind, for the first, blind for the first 20 years of life. Even in this 20-year-old brain, there is dramatic change happening in a matter of just a few months. So this is direct evidence that there is tremendous preserved plasticity even two decades after birth. So, um, so there seems to be less activation as you go. I right. Mean, can you... <laughs> Okay, so I was trying to skirt that issue, but... <laughs> so, Jim, uh, you are forcing me to describe what we are doing here. Um, so this is, uh, Richie is the, the world expert in this. Uh, so this is resting state functional connectivity. Richie was talking about the default mode network this morning. So the person is simply lying in the scanner doing nothing. Uh, but the brain is never silent. Even when the person is doing nothing, the brain is active. So we observe that spontaneous activity of the brain for a few minutes, and then we try to see which parts of the brain are behaving similarly. So which parts of the brain are fluctuating up and down in their activity similarly, and that's what these maps are showing. So what we notice is that before surgery and soon after surgery, much of the back of the brain, which is the visual cortex, is behaving monolithically. If one part of the visual cortex is, is active, it's highly likely that another part of the visual cortex is also so very active. active. Yeah. As time progresses, the visual cortex seems to become decorrelated. So different parts of the visual cortex seem to do their own independent thing. Oh, okay. And that increase in independence is a, a good thing um, because that means you're not wasting resources of the brain. So can you say what a, a behavioral correlate of that, in, that independence is? Yeah. So let me give an example of why independence is, is important. Uh, and because my background is in computer science, I'll take an example from computer science and then we'll talk about uh, the behavioral correlate. So imagine that you have eight bits of a computer. Um, and each one of these bits can be either zero or one. That's the language of the, of the computer. Now, if all eight bits are highly correlated, then you can have only two patterns that you can store, all zeros or all ones. If, on the other hand, these eight bits were to be independent, then you can have two to the power of eight patterns, 256 patterns. So your ability to represent information greatly increases if you increase the independence of the encoding units. And the behavioral correlate would be you are able to, to encode many more images. So different images can have their own representations. <laughs> But 
even if so his holiness is wandering in this difference as the you know the the progress being made in yeah. the visual capacity of of this subject um to what extent its actual ability of the visual processing itself, or to what extent there is a differentiation from the mind construction One, playing wonderful a role? Question. That's an absolutely wonderful question, and that is exactly the distinction that I want to draw between brain and behavior. So the brain can change, and it may have no consequences on behavior. What we want to see is exactly what uh, Your Holiness, you're pointing out, that we need to know that behavior is also improving while yeah. we are seeing the brain changes. Yeah. Um, so His Holiness was asking, you know, since you have done these experiments on children who were blind before and they have been, you know, treated, um, would there be any difference you would expect in the way in which the children would respond facially in terms of when, when someone takes, you know, loves them, you know, and mother's physical contact or mm. the hugs yeah pat yeah indeed has a response yeah absolutely any differences after after having the visual so, capacity so their their ability to express expressions seems not to change so even when they are blind and you uh, interact with them in a certain way, the expressions that they exhibit on their faces are pretty much the same as the expressions on your face or on my face. And that does not undergo a change with, with the onset of sight. What does change, of course, is their ability to make sense of other people's expressions. <laughs> I think one of the questions His Holiness is asking is whether the ability, the increased ability to make sense of others' mm. expressions has a behavioral consequence for the... For yeah, the, that's for the a child. very important question. We haven't, haven't looked at that, yeah. whether there's a richness, an added richness with their visual input. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. We haven't looked at it yet. Um, <laughs> Infection was asking question, it's probably more direct to what something Richie said. Um, you know, we were talking about you know, qualities like affection and uh, love and so on. Uh, so in the distinction we were making between perception versus concept-based thoughts, you know, which category would it belong? Like the sensory versus mental. You know, blind person, and after open, not much differences, affection. So affection mainly related with uh, Mental, yeah, mm. rather than sensory. No. Or a con conceptual yeah. or thought. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, wouldn't, it would not depend on the specific sense faculty. Anger also not depend on sensory. Anger also. Anger would fall into the same category. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, all emotions, because emotions can be elicited through different through different sense faculties or from the mind itself. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the one thing that I want uh, us to take away from this 
a set of data is that the brain has tremendous ability to change even late in, in childhood, early adulthood. Um, I have additional data that I'll skip through just in the interest of time. Um, you have time. You can, I do? Yeah. OK. So well, this is a very conventional style of analysis of fMRI data. So this is the normal adult brain, normally sighted individual. If Jinpa were to be my experimental subject, and while he's lying in the scanner, I were to show him different kinds of images, say, images of chairs, images of glasses, images of faces, images of landscapes, what I would find is that different parts of Jimpa's brain are more activated for different visual categories. Um, so for faces, for instance, the red region in the brain, especially in the right hemisphere, that is more activated for face images than for any other category of images. They explain that this is radiological convention, that the left and right is radiological. Right, right, right. So you're seeing <laughs> the, the right side of the brain shown on the left part of the, of the image. That's radiological convention. It's as if you're looking at the person resting on the bed, and you're looking at them from their feet up. So is it the, in the scanner? In the scanner. The, the, yeah. 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 That in the normal brain, for the class of faces, there's this little splotch of the cortex that is more activated when the person sees face images than when they see non-face images. We can... So we can then ask what would we see in the case of a Prakash child immediately after surgery and at various time points after surgery? Would we see evidence of this kind of activation in their brain? Or would it need to develop over time? And what we see with the Prakash children is that if you were to do the imaging scan the very day that the bandages are opened, there is no differential activation to faces. There is no hotspot. But it comes about very quickly. So this is two days post-surgery for a 21-year-old. <laughs> Yeah. So at two days, you're already beginning to see some activation in roughly the right area. Maybe use the cursor you can show. Oh, yeah. So there, you're seeing the activation in roughly the right area. And then as time progresses, so that's at one month, sure, 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 sure. at four months, and 10 months. So by about 10 months, there is, to the level that we can resolve it, there is no difference between the activation that we see in a Prakash child's brain uh, compared to the activation that we see in a normal and subject's brain. Thank you much, Dante. Keep on me, but channel. That's what you're saying. What about um, what about color perception? Good question. So color perception is available right from the outset, right from day one. Tambukurane ni yung gusto sa. But what about some? People who can't see different, who can't see colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they are certainly colorblind individuals, and we have a similar proportion of colorblind yeah. people in the Prakash. It doesn't mean all of your guys are Kashi Ji, your was. That is, that the book me share to do that. That guys are manual chipper shas. Ma to they keep on with us. Me thong ya go to do ga na chay nyam bo. Hmm. Thong thong do. And I should also say to your whole in this question, color perception is normal in that if I were to show a child who has just had the bandage opened, if I were to show them two different colors and I were to ask them, are these two the same colors or different colors, they will be able to respond correctly, but they will not be able to name the colors, which is kind of understandable. They don't know what green is or what red is. <laughs> So what, what exactly is then missing in the colorblind people? Yes, yeah, so colorblindness results from an anomaly in the cones of the retina. Uh, so 
I could have been colorblind. Ma males are more likely to be colorblind. So typically, we have three types of cones, three types of cone photoreceptors. If I'm missing one of the cone types, then I will be unable to see certain kinds of colors. <laughs> So it's not really a function of brain, it's more the function of the central organ. That it's an example of something that's bottom up. Right, exactly. So there is one interesting condition called achromatopsia, which is actually brain-related. So people who have injury in a certain part of the brain suddenly lose color vision. So, um, just looking at these two small examples, I hope uh, you will agree that there is evidence, direct evidence in that, that the brain retains its plasticity well into life. But the more important question, as uh, uh, Your Holiness, you pointed out, we need to be concerned about whether behavior is going to benefit from the surgery. So one way of addressing that question would simply be to look at the child's behavior. Does the child benefit from the treatment? And I'll show you a short video of a young girl who is 11 years old. Her name is Sumitra. You will see Sumitra pre-surgically and then eight days post-surgery. And in both cases, we have asked Sumitra to find a little box of candy, a little box of chocolates that we have put on the side of the hospital corridor. Um, so you'll see how much difficulty she has pre-surgically, because at that time, her vision is just light and dark perception. She can tell night from day, but no more. <laughs> So, so here we go. So despite all of the help that her father is trying to give her and that little boy was trying to give her, she just has a very hard time finding anything. And now you see her <coughs> eight days post-surgery. <laughs> so it makes a big, big impact on the abilities of the, of the children. This is Sumitra, uh, the little girl that you just saw, pre-surgically and then post-surgically. So that is, uh, it's, an, it's a nice video, but it's anecdotal. Um, we really need to follow up those kinds of observations with rigorous scientific studies. And my students and I, over the past few years, have been studying the visual abilities of many, many of these children across a range of dimensions of vision. So things like basic acuity, how clear are the images? How much contrast do they need in order to, to perceive things? Um, how susceptible are they to visual illusions? How well can they recognize faces? So across many different dimensions, we find that these children are able to to improve their capabilities dramatically 
from before to after surgery. Um, I won't go into the details of any of these except for one that we are particularly proud of, and that has to do with the connection between vision and other sensory modalities. Um, so the lower right, the bar graph in the lower right uh, relates to that, that finding. Let me describe why we are so excited about this result. The question that this study was addressing is a very famous question. And in fact, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy has this to say about, about the question that we were studying. There is no problem in the history of the philosophy of perception that has provoked more thought than the problem that Molyneux raised in 1688. Molyneux's problem is one of the most fruitful thought, thought experiments ever proposed in the history of philosophy. So we were going... That, can you present the, the, problem, the problem itself? The problem. Yes. Yeah. So what is Molyneux's problem? It's this. So this is William Molyneux, who, the, the 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 who was an Irish philosopher and scientist in the late 17th century. So the late 17th century was a period of great debates between the nativists and the empiricists, the nature-nurture debate. Are we born with all of the knowledge that we need, or do we have to learn that knowledge? So Molyneux was thinking about that same question, um, but he wanted to crystallize that somewhat abstract debate. And it so happened that his wife, soon after his marriage, went blind. So his thoughts in thinking about the nature-nurture question shifted to blindness, and he posed the following question. So he asked, this is his language, <laughs> Suppose a man born blind and taught by his touch to distinguish between a cube and a sphere. Suppose the blind man be made to see. Query whether by his sight, before he touched them, he could now distinguish and tell which is the globe and which the cube. So just to illustrate this, let's say I was born blind and I have grown to the age of, say, 30 years with my blindness, and during this period of blindness, I've come to recognize this object, and I've come to recognize this object by touch. Then, at the age of 30 years, some miracle happens, and I suddenly gain sight, and Richie, as the experimenter, the first thing he does is he shows me these two objects, but he doesn't let me touch them. Would I be able to immediately say, using my vision, that that's the computer remote and that's the AC remote. So, I mean, even in our case, we don't need to look. We can kind of touch something and recognize it exactly. so through the sensation of touch. Absolutely, and you're absolutely right in pointing that out. I can feel this in total darkness, and subsequently, I can just look at it and say that was the object I was touching. But the question that Molyneux is asking is this ability, did I have to learn it, or did I come prepared 
with this innately to what my brain hardwired that it ngaju do se je yem je tan thue te ngo le me ton me ne la be cha je ngo je ngo she bu de je ma me ton de ta ji cha la de pigre she sam ngo je ton ngo bas tu ngo je thu be de ma zu le hengi ge cha je je yo ba ton ne ngo je thu bu re ya jor jung ko ton ne jang je le pse ba nyo ba je re sa ko thi wa te re sa could be lare lare could be both there's could a be sort both, of right. inborn capacity mm-hmm. but when it comes to the detail level of differentiation could be. those could be learned exactly and that's why molyneux asked about the cube and the sphere i mean they are two very different objects and the question is would this person who miraculously gained sight would they immediately be able to distinguish at least these two very coarsely different objects So, for over 300 years, <laughs> philosophers <laughs> had talked about, had discussed this question. Neuroscientists had been interested in this question, but there were no subjects of this kind who would miraculously gain sight. So the question had remained open for over 300 years. With Project Prakash, we finally had the opportunity to answer, at least to address this question. And we did. and the results turned out to be very clear we were afraid that given that this is biology the results may be messy but the results were remarkably clear um well so we did this experiment <laughs> and it turns out it's very semanalolia nagungilia pubola lavaj nagungilia nagungilia pubola lavaj je ne de pubotu samsam ke lo ke de gala ni punze punze mi she yo marwa Puse mi she me dio gala ti pobo ni no ko mi she sta ki dio gala ni ko se mi she mo e pachi ki lu she si to ni pu pa ti pu sha dio gala ko mo ni ti ko mo so so ke chu si yo ge pu sha dio ti yo tu chala yo re se so it turns out i was um, oh, discussing that uh, similar questions have been raised in buddhist epistemology Huh. So imagine being in the dark. Someone touches an object and recognizes this is the vase, the uh-huh. pot, and then because of that perception, give rise to this perceptual judgment. Yeah, I see the pot. You know, here is the pot. But technically, you know, pot perception is supposed to be a visual perception. Mm. But the perceptual judgment right. has been derived not by a visual perception. So there seems to be a cross modality. um of of the senses right, right right yeah so that's exactly the issue that we are tackling how does this cross modality develop so there might be a difference whether the person is congenitally blind or not so if the person had the experience of seeing something before mm-hmm. you associate that with a particular shape yes but if the person has never seen that object before and then is able to gain sight later that association hasn't taken place indeed indeed right so the the nativists of the 17th century and later were of the opinion that even without having had visual experience maybe the brain represents shape information in such a way that even though you might be getting that information initially by touch you would transfer that information to vision immediately you would not need to have that period of learning um but the empiricists thought just as i believe uh, your holiness you're thinking that there would be a period needed where people would need to learn how one modality relates to another mm-hmm. and indeed that's what we found that immediately after the bandages were opened these children could not tell what they were feeling from what they were looking oh, yeah. so the quran to legacy to na cheri to to the to je ko ob jara yo ris ดิรายดิกอลตันดุกุนยุงกานามานาชิงกิเงมาจานะทอมานยงเวยนซานลูชิกรจิงตุนเนอะซินติเมจามาติกิติทอมปุทวานยงกุจิจิตุนยอมา
individual recognition, they can't even tell the distinction between a face from a non-face. You can show them two images, one of a face, one of a non-face. And even if that one face is their mother's face. Mm -hmm. Even if that, right, yeah. yeah. Wow. yeah. There also is the experience of dream. 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 Yeah. So, so it's only as curious since the congenitally blind mm -hmm. would be dreaming. So yeah. how, what kind of images would they have in dream? Yeah, so that I would love to have a good answer to that question, <laughs> and we don't. Uh, so I have been curious about the same question, and I've asked the children very often what are your dreams like? Mm. And the words that they use to describe their dreams, even before the surgery, are pretty much like the words you or I would use in order to describe our dreams. So they say, well, we see, <laughs> we see people, we see things. Um, so they use the word see. Yeah, yeah. Because the tongues, the tongues, the tongues. We haven't tried that. The thing is, a lot of our perceptions of shape and color are so dominated by visual paradigm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So without right. visual experience, how can one think of even dreaming right. of seeing? Yeah, so because it's such a fascinating, fascinating question, we want to pursue it very rigorously. And one way that we can go beyond just subjective reports is by doing EEG, so electroencephalography, while the child is sleeping, before surgery and after and surgery. Then. It won't give us very precise information, but it'll at least show us which part of the brain is active when the child is in the REM phase, the rapid eye movement phase of, of sleep. So we'll be able to tell whether it's the visual part of the brain that's more active, or the auditory part of the brain, or the somato, somato sensory part. Ah, So this question is partly addressed to Richie as well. Um, His Holiness was asking, you know, people who have never had a visual experience before. Um, of course, they will have emotions like all of us, but his Solon is wondering whether they will have less extreme emotions like attachment and aversion and anger and so on, or no difference? Hmm. I, 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 th I don't think it's ever been studied from that perspective. Uh, it would be very interesting, although I would expect that the same kinds of attachments and aversions would arise through other sensory modalities. That would be my expectation, but it's never been studied. Because many of the um, kind of emotional experiences that we have, responses, are triggered by sights, visions of, you know, objects, as well as hearing something. He, yeah. Taste, yeah. 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 But in certain parts of the animal kingdom, the, <laughs> the primary sensory modality is olfaction. The comment she wanted to make. So blind children uh, learn words like look and see very early, but what those words mean to them is different because of their experience. So if you tell a sighted child, um, if you take a sighted child and put a blindfold on them and you tell them, you can uh, touch this table, but don't look at it. What the sighted child will do is go like this, explore it. What a blind child will do is go like this. And if you say, okay, now you can look at it, what the blind child will do then is go and explore it. Uh, what a sighted child will do is stare at it, right? So the way they're interpreting those words is contingent on their experience. If they can see, then they think sight is something you do with the eyes, but if they can't see, they interpret it as explore, usually with the hands. Mm -hmm. 
እንደነ እኛኙ ነው ሽው ችግሬስ ቶክ ቶስ ማንሲግ ማሪስ እኛኙ ነው ችግሬስ ተንዴንዛ ተበታ ቶም ታኝ በጀሸነ ያንኳን ዙ ዲል ፓፐ ሲንደዋች ታንዴ if you um, blindfold a sighted child and say look up they will go like this even though they can't see because they're blindfolded but if you tell a blind child look up they will go like this ala kesa the the me lo me ne so le ya me ta me kap sha tu gala ya me ya ta sala na na ya ta ya to ko de over de ya de chires na mi urbe de me ma so le ya ya ta sala na la ba ya ta nyu ya nyu ya ta bi chires the question of dreams is a fascinating one and we will keep pursuing it and try to find some rigorous answers to your to your questions um so part one of the answer to molinius question is that there is not a, an immediate transfer immediately after sight onset but the an addendum to this which is perhaps even more interesting than the first part and that is that if you let these children explore the world with both their eyes and their hands for even as little as a week the one week of exploration after sight with their hands and their eyes is enough for them to build a mapping between the two senses so the ability to transfer even though it's not present right away it's acquired very very rapidly me sab che jo lam san lu shig re be chala di ke de me mon jin che tu ya de yo ngu yo mares የማርዴ ትራጂክስ ናውሎ ያ ኛምኞ ሳይ ዲጎ ላምሳ አኒ ላበ ቻነ ሬግኒ ጫላ ሙዚ ጀማታ ሚግ ቶንጀ ሙዚ ጀበኒደ ፓሶ ዴጉ ደቦ ትቱቱስ ትራጂክስ ናውሎ ላይ በጀ ያ ቦሶ ቶቱሳ እንጂ ወምብሽ አለ ሸብኒ Narem so his holiness was saying that um, so it makes sense if you are thinking in terms of um, the the actual advancement of the sensory faculty itself which takes time because we're talking about physical basis hmm. but the mental capacity you know one you know if you just purely look at it from the mental processes taking that long doesn't seem to make sense so would you agree is it more a kind of a progressive strengthening of the sensory faculties so i would argue that it's not the eye that's developing during this period so the seven day period during which the child is able to acquire the touch to vision mapping it's not because the eye is getting better because the clarity of vision is the same immediately after surgery as it is a week after surgery all basic aspects of vision are the same and yet this mapping comes about so i believe that this mapping is at the cortical level cortical it's level. not not the sense we apparatus one more rang rem do sa one more rang ki chaye rem do in samares one more rang tone ke ba in samares ka sa one more me che sabe shu de to to jo pochi na lo ya to ya sam se bu ton to yo res then me she ke ton wa da lu she re bani bu de paru le de to ke ja jor wa ta ti le bu rang tone ጅግጅም ደወስ ወዴ ኮሪያ ዲቲ ለበራን ማቶ ወንቡ ኩራን ኢንሳማሪስ ቢኮ ወንቡ ኩራን ቶንየን በሴቡ ቶንጊ ኦሬስ ቸው ቸው ሰበ ሹቴ ቡት ዩ ሆሊነስ አይ ሼር ዩር ዩር ፓዝልመንት አት ሃው ካን ዲስ ማፒንግ ኮም አቦት ሶ ራፒድሊ ኤንድ ዳትስ ዋይ አይ ሄቭ ሊስትድ ዘ ኦፕን ኩሽን አስ ዋት ካይንድስ ኦፍ ሜካኒዝምስ ማይት አካውንት ፎር ሰች ራፒድ ለርኒንግ ኤንድ ዳትስ ዘ ቢግ ኦፕን ኩሽን ዘት ኬም አቦት ቢኮዝ ኦፍ ዲስ ኤክስፔሪመንታል ዎርክ and a lot of the labs research since we did this work has gone into experimental and theoretical work looking at how we can how we can provide an answer to such a rapid learning process um then maybe silly question the people person who very much learned one and person who 
not my sort of uh, learn, learned. Any differences on brain? <laughs> hmm? I don't think we... I so hear. are there differences in the brain of the very learned people versus just the not so learned people? Just in general, not with blindness. Mm. Um, so there is some differences. So there isn't any specific difference that one can point to. So in fact, with Albert Einstein, people were very curious was there something different about Einstein's brain relative to the normal brain uh, that made him so intelligent? So people sliced up his brain and tried to see whether there were any gross differences, and they weren't. Your mm. Madison. Yeah, that, that's a specific skill. Right. So it's not general intelligence. <laughs> In Tibetan kind of, uh, or Indo-Tibetan um, thought about education and the learning process, we distinguish between different types of intelligence, swift intelligence, and penetrating intelligence, and kind of more expansive, synthetic intelligence, and so on. So, um, and you see that manifest differently in, 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 in actual life. For example, among the monastic scholars, some are very good at you know, questioning and driving that line of thinking. Some are very good at memorization. And some are good at deeper con comprehension. So, so th these kind of variations one would expect at the level of brain, in Absolutely. the brain. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and also I th in the West there are theories that uh, are uh, well accepted of multiple intelligences, not just a single uh, characteristic. And with that, there is evidence to suggest that there is some uh, uh, correlates in the brain, for example, to expertise in music uh, or expertise in, in, in certain other domains. There's some work which, which does suggest that there is uh, Th these neural correlates. Yeah. But with respect to general intelligence, that whole question is a much more um, controversial uh, because of the, 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 the issue of what it general intelligence actually is. Hmm. between two types of kind of, you know, uh, cognitive processes. On the one hand, you have more effectively oriented processes like compassion, empathy, and so on. Then on, on the other, they are much more rationally oriented processes like intelligence, you know, uh, insight. Um, so can, can one say there are correlates broadly corresponding to these two broad patterns? subject is a different sort of, a different subject Larin. to learn. The Since you spoke about there being some correlates between musical intelligence, mm -hmm. so, you know, following that line of thinking. I mean, the, we need to make a distinction between structural correlates, differences in the actual structure of the brain, and functional correlates, how the brain is actually working. With respect to functional correlates, I think there's good evidence to suggest that there are those associations. With differences in brain structure, it's more complicated and less well established. At, at a very crude level, you can picture two computers that have exactly the same hardware where 
a very crude set of programs is loaded on one, a very sophisticated set of programs is loaded on another, and one looks a lot more intelligent than the other, but in terms of their hardware, they're identical. Okay. Um, <laughs> so what about when doubt arises in the brain? Is there a particular activation, signature activation? When doubt? Doubt, yeah. Mm, I, I don't know of any work that has looked at that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, Richie? Uh, I'm, my doubt is arising. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are, um, I think that there are uh, things, that there are qualities related to doubt. <laughs> The reason why Solonis is asking this is because when we think about cognition, generally cognition's function is to know. But doubt, when doubt arises, it seems to be some almost like disrupting that natural function. Yeah. Well, there have been studies, so if you have a person performing a task, and it's a difficult task, and you ask them, in addition to performing the task, please rate how confident you are that you are correct. And some people will say, I'm very confident, and other people might say, not so confident. So there's some doubt. And there are differences in certain parts of the brain which have been detected in specific contexts between being very confident and being not so confident. And so there, uh, in, in we, we often refer to that as meta-awareness. It's, it's kind of, um, it's an awareness of the um, broader context. It's an awareness of uh, your performance. So you could be very focused on your performance, but you can also be aware of how you're doing. Uh, and it's that meta-awareness which is uh, associated with the representation of both confidence and doubt. Uh, and that's something that has been studied some. Uh, when I just when I dis discussed with uh, Wolf Singer, we had a lot of discussion about when Wolf the Singer brain is, the, when we don't come to a state of indecision, we don't know the answer to something. It's not quite like doubt, but we, we cannot be sure of something. So the brain is processing all the information. And he says that when we finally get the answer, then it's a very satisfactory state. It's so a very satisfactory, satisfactory state. Sort of a kind of relief. And then when we are in this uh, unresolved state, it's like uh, something not completely uh, fulfilled. So he said there's a kind of... Uh, so that he was alluding to some state of meditation where we feel very much at peace and uh, sort of confident. And he said because there is no many unresolved issues going on. So it's linked somehow with the sense of confidence. But I, I no, then the wolf singer like this thing does, but now, which is that net zero, which is that tall, some time, some some time, they go tap share money, they go like a level the teller, which which is good, right? And then which is like that tap share money, they go like any, yeah, that takes some time, they go like a relief to them, they go like a sense of relief and satisfaction. The thing that that which is now, I'm going to get on a lot of money, they go like some my thing, my charge, some help you on the. It's also important to note on this topic that confidence can also be mis misplaced. Uh, you can have a false confidence. Uh, and in fact, we've done some studies with meditators, some very long-term meditators, who are very confident that they can report accurately on what's going on in their own body. For example, detecting their own heartbeat, 
They say they're very confident, but their performance is not any better than an average person. Uh, so the only difference is their confidence. <laughs> 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 So, Pavan, please go on. <laughs> um, so, this is one of the open questions that we, uh, as you can tell, it's a very rich question. It leads to all kinds of further questions. But basically, we want to understand what kinds of, of mechanisms could be at the root of such rapid learning. And the hints, we still don't have the definitive answer, but we be are beginning to have hints of what the answer might be. And the hints are coming from a different line of experimentation. And that is the line of experimentation on understanding visual images. So here you have a natural visual image on the left side. And if I were to give you a pen, and, uh, and I were to ask you, outline all the objects that, that you see in that image, you would, without much difficulty, be able to produce an image of the kind that we see on the right. So you can delineate objects from natural images. And that's an amazing accomplishment because this image, which seems so easy to interpret, is actually very complex. So if you were to put this into a computer program and you ask the computer program to outline all regions of different colors and different brightnesses, that's what the computer program gives. So that is the real structure of the image. It's a very complicated structure. And somehow the brain is able to integrate subsets of these regions into objects. And nobody knows how that integration happens. How are we putting together small sets of these regions into meaningful assemblies? So with Project Prakash, so, we had... Um, Bhavan, I think yeah. you might want to explain why would you say that the middle one is the computer representation of the visual experience? It's not. It's not. And that's the, that's the key point, that the visual experience is on the right. It's as objects. But the real signal that our okay, eyes okay. are getting is, is the, the one, one okay. in the middle. So we are just so good at this task that we don't realize what an accomplishment it is that our brains are able to parse images into objects. So his holiness was saying that this makes sense because if you look at the Buddhist epistemological thinking, there is a lot of discussion on how the actual sensory input that we're receiving is composed of so many yeah. part, you know, parts. Indeed. And yeah. then some kind of structure has to be created. Right, right. Yeah. And it's an active process that we are able to extract these structures from this complicated image. And we can ask, are the Prakash children immediately able to do this task? Or do they pass through some intervening stages? And it turns out that the Prakash children initially see the world in pieces. So this is one Prakash subject. We are showing him these different images. And we are asking him to say, well, recognize these objects. And of course, he can't. He simply doesn't know the names. But then we say, even if you can't recognize these objects, just outline what the objects are. And you'd notice how he's outlining every little region of a different color or different luminance. So even the shadow on the cricket ball becomes its own object. So the world for the Prakash children, soon after sight onset, is broken up into many little pieces. 
and they have a hard time putting all these pieces together. But then you introduce one special kind of cue, and that's what you see in this video, and the world seems to cohere. So here's a video of a Prakash subject. You can't Achha. make that out? Can't make it up. Up. Right. अच्छा यहाँ कितनी चीजें हैं एक बार फिर से किन की बताइए हाँ हाँ अच्छा ठीक अच्छा अब बताइए कितनी चीजें हैं दो अच्छा क्या क्या हैं ये चीजें चक्कर और बोल सिंपल मोशन seems to bring about this magical transformation. Mm. So, so several experiments of this kind are leading us to suggest that it's not the instantaneous visual input that the brain needs or makes inferences off of, but rather how that information changes over time. So it's the, the paths of the objects over time that seem to be crucial for allowing the brain to make sense of the visual, visual world. So Jay, I believe, uh, talked about synchronic and diachronic identities. So it seems like diachronic identity is really crucial for the brain. And Jimpa, you had in your presentation talked about uh, these very transient, in the moment kinds of inputs versus temporally extended uh, inputs. And again, it appears that temporally extended input seems to be very important for the brain to make sense of the visual world. One One question, had a okay. comment. Um, so, motion, dynamic movement clarifies or creates or allows meaning, right? What about your first answer, that the newly sighted cannot do cross-modal mapping without learning? So those stimuli, were they presented dynamically or statically? Statically, but the person was able to, was free to move to around. Move yeah, they could. But did they? They did, yeah. So you look at the videos of the children doing that Molyneux task, and they are looking around. Uh, so there's no restraint on them for... But that's still different, isn't it? If you move around and there's a cube and a square indeed, sitting... Indeed, indeed. So uh, what we are doing with those objects, as you saw in that one picture of the child looking at a cube and, a, and, a, uh, and this disk, the objects are being presented on an uncluttered background. So there's no issue of object segmentation. And these are very simple objects. So we are trying to minimize the burden on the brain yeah, yeah, to yeah. do this background segmentation. Yeah. But if you were to require segmentation, then it seems that motion holds the magic key. No other cue, not color, not mm. texture, not mm. luminance, is as important as motion. So this idea, uh, or this observation, leads us to suggest... So this leads us to suggest that this question about how the brain learns to do region integration, part, at least part of that answer might be the use of dynamic information. Um, and to Vasu's point, how does this relate to the cross-modal integration? We believe that this idea 
of using the dynamics of the world carries over to the problem of acquiring in intermodal uh, integration. So here, well, in this case, we were talking about intramodal. Within vision, how do we link up these yes. bits and pieces? With cross-modal, we're talking about linking up the bits and pieces from different modalities. But I think the same computational principle applies. Um, so essentially, uh, if one were to think about the formal structure of the problem, your hand or your haptic, your touch system is giving you some information about the world. So H0 through HN are some features, some sensory information from the hand. Simultaneously, the visual apparatus is giving you some visual features. And what the brain has to do is to figure out what kinds of haptic features are associated with what kinds of visual features. And that association, we hypothesize, uh, we have some experimental data that I'm not going to go through, but uh, the, the theory is that that association between vision and touch or vision and any other modality is built up not by looking at just instantaneous mappings, but by looking at how information changes in both of these modalities over time. So we're looking at time series of sensory experience in order to make that association. So I actually had a few slides that went through an exam. So would you say that here habituation also makes a difference? It's something that you're familiar, the association will be very fast across modalities. So this would work even without familiarity. So immediately after sight onset, what we are finding experimentally, that even though the child doesn't have familiarity with any of the visual entities, what they are able to do, what they are able to do is to appreciate how visual inputs are changing over time. And that's all that's needed in order to bootstrap this kind of cross-modal mapping. So as an example of that, uh, this is one experiment that we do with the Prakash children. Imagine that I make a video of you talking, Jimpa. And uh, let's say I make two videos, two five-minute videos. And you are saying different things in these two videos. Now what I do for the Prakash child is I present both of these videos, but I play the soundtrack of only one of them. And I ask the child which of these talking heads is actually doing the talking. So one of these videos is going to be correlated with the sound envelope, and the other is not. Even though the Prakash child may have no understanding of Tibetan, may not even be able to recognize that this is a face, they will be able to say that this is the entity that's doing the, the movements that are correlated with the, with the sound. So that's what we find, that right from sight onset, the ability to, to determine which sensory signals are going up and down similarly, that seems to be present right away. Yeah. Then <laughs> When I, when I hear Pavan talk about the different sensory modalities, and I also am reminded, Your Holiness, of your reference often to the origins of compassion in the mother-child interaction, 
uh, reflecting on that kind of early interaction, it seems that it is a very um, multimodal experience with touch, sound, vision, smell, all of those sensory modalities are participating. Uh, and, um, uh, and so I wonder how the expression of compassion may be different uh, in a, uh, a child who, who is blind or who has other sensory deficits. Yeah. Uh, so to summarize this, to answer this question of how is inter and intramodal integration acquired, our best hypothesis at the moment is that the dynamics of the world, how the environment changes over time, that seems to play a key role. So in terms of understanding what is the processing algorithm by which the brain learns, this seems to be one of the key elements of that dynamics. That idea, even though it's so simple to state, it has very broad ramifications, and let me just touch upon those. So what we're finding is that the use of dynamic information is important not just for breaking up the world into objects, it's important not just for connecting vision with other modalities, but rather for many of the abilities, visual abilities that we've tested, for which we initially thought that there would be different developmental pathways like face perception or perception of causality, we are finding that many of them are building upon this common building block, which is dynamic information processing. So the appreciation of how things change over time, that seems to be fundamental to the way the brain learns uh, to do vision. This idea then has broad uh, broader impact that goes beyond just understanding visual development, and I'll just touch upon one of them. Um, and in, in describing the broader impact, it's also nice to be able to make the point that the results of this project that is being done in India, they apply more broadly. The, the, the benefits that flow from Project Prakash, they're not just confined to the Indian children, who are receiving surgeries, but rather they belong to all of us on the planet. So uh, the US funded Project Prakash, and now we are able to give back some of the results that we're finding from Project Prakash are proving useful for things that are relevant to the US and many other countries. And just one example of that is understanding autism. Autism is a condition that's acquiring epidemic proportions in the US. So according to the Center for Disease Control, one in 66 children in the US are on the autism spectrum. Actually, the most recent date is one in 46. Oh, my goodness. One in, one in 46. So autism has been a... Oh. It has, it has been a very complex disorder to make sense of because so many abilities are affected in this condition. The face perception is affected, the mapping between the different sensory modalities is affected, uh, the ability to break up an image into objects, that's affected, the perception of cause and effect. And people have this, this panoply of difficulties that accompany autism that has led people to believe that maybe Autism is associated with just a diverse set of insults to the brain. Um, many aspects of the brain are being affected. But if there is any truth to the hypothesis that we are working with in Project Prakash, that dynamic information processing underlies the development of all of these different abilities, then a the hypothesis that we can make is that there may be an impairment 
in that common building block in the understanding of the dynamic world that then leads to all of these other impairments. So it's right. given us a hypothesis, a very specific target that we can go after and we can try to see whether dynamic information processing is in fact compromised in autism. So we've already been doing quite a few experiments. I want to show you uh, two short video clips from... But before you do that, yeah. can you just clarify for everyone what you mean by dynamic information processing? Yeah, so in the simplest case, it's just uh, the ability to make use of information that's elapsed until a certain point to anticipate what's going to happen next. Um, that's the hallmark of good dynamic information processing. Uh, you observe the world for a certain amount of time and then you can make predictions about what's going to happen next. Uh, if you can't do that, then it's very hard to interact with a dynamic, dynamically changing world. So that's our hypothesis that maybe autism is accompanied by some impairment in dynamic information processing. In order to test this, we are devising various dynamic settings that children with autism or children uh, who are not autistic have to interact with. So what you'll see here um, are videos of two children. The first one is not autistic. The second one is autistic. They are both playing this video game called Pong where the child controls the paddle uh, that you see on the left, the little vertical bar. And there's a little ball that you see as the white square that will bounce around the room. While the child is playing this game, we are monitoring where they're looking. The goal of the game is to prevent the ball from going out of the room. So they have to move the paddle to block the ball. And the other thing is that the ground is not going to be able to do it. The negative thing is that the child is not going to be able to do it. The child is not going to dynamic information process dynamic information processing autistic the orders to take the main number of the Jama to the Dekanga Tegora, the detail the dynamic information processing the Lia, can show you in a manners, the Taja chair, the Timothy Rune, and the media Kawatagoto, then the big carb with the Polarwa, the politic Chilo Mandroa Cheche, Nyago Yugala, the Pu, autistic Nanyeta, Mananya Nilia, Timothy Vrio came to Seruchu, and the Mika Watagoto, Kuzumita, and the Labe. So in red are the eye traces where the child is looking. So I'll set this in motion. This is, remember, a child not, uh, who's not autistic, a norm, neurotypical child. And what you notice is this beautiful anticipation. Uh, the child already begins to look at where the ball is going to go well before the ball gets there. And as I was saying to Richie, that's one of the hallmarks of good dynamic information processing, extrapolating from what you have seen so far, so that you can take anticipate reaction. The the poly So next we'll see a, a similar video trace from a child with autism playing the game. And the red dots are their eye movements. Their eye movements. Yeah. Red is eye movements. Mahabuti tana mi kawatagi yoyeme te soba chasitra. Mahabuti ta mahabuti mi kawatagi yoyeme te mikwa kawatagi yoyeme te. Okay, so here we go. This is an autistic child. So now notice that instead of anticipating where the ball is going to go, the child keeps following where the ball has already been. So experiments like this are beginning to give us some insight into whether dynamic information processing is compromised in autism and how it is compromised. Uh, um, and we seem to be building 
a nice circumstantial case that indeed we may have hit upon one of the core impairments of autism. And all of the seed for this idea came directly from Project Prakash. Um, last year, we published uh, these ideas as a theory, um, autism as a disorder of prediction, which is guiding our, our experiments. And it also has implications for diagnoses and better therapies for the condition. Um, and finally, just in terms of the impact of Project Prakash, uh, given that we are learning how a Prakash child makes, begins to make sense of the visual world, we are beginning to translate that understanding towards creating autonomous robots that can also learn about the visual environment entirely autonomously. But I'm not going to talk about that here. So let me summarize. Project Prakash. So Project Prakash, in the past about 10 years, it has proven to be a very satisfying, a very gratifying project. It has given us some insights regarding brain plasticity and the processes by which the brain learns. It has given us some unexpected clinically relevant hypotheses like for autism. Something that I didn't describe, it's guiding the design of our artificial intelligence systems that can learn on their own. And um, very gratifyingly, it's beginning to serve as a model for an alternative paradigm. And that alternative paradigm, I'd like to call uh, using a word that your holiness you like very much, compassionate science. So, we tend to think of science as this dispassionate activity. It needs to be removed from all sense of caring about the subjects that we're working with, other than the ethical and the legal aspects. But I believe that there are tremendous benefits to be gained by merging the humanitarian and the scientific side of things. And Project Prakash serves as one example of that kind of a model. And of course, Project Prakash has played a role, howsoever modest, in alleviating uh, the burden of childhood blindness in India. Um, these results have begun to, to make an impact in the scientific community. A couple of months ago, we were featured on the cover of, of science, so showing uh, this, the great amount of brain plasticity that the Prakash children have that is, is overturning some of the dogmas of neuroscience. And also, these findings are beginning to percolate in the, in the lay or the popular press. And that's important because if we are to have any hope of changing policy, of serving an advocacy role, then we have to make sure that the results that emerge from Project Prakash don't just stay confined to the scientific journal, but they also uh, are made accessible to the public at large and to the policymakers. So these are all very satisfying, but the most satisfying aspect of Project Prakash, as you might imagine, is observing, being witness, <laughs> being witness to the changes in the lives of the children that we've worked with. So, so far we have screened, provided screening to over 40,000 children, uh, provided surgical care to over 450 of them, and non-surgical care to about 1,400. And each one of these children um, carries with him or her their own story of tremendous hardships. But what's more interesting is the, the story of hope that begins to be written after their surgery. And I want to show you uh, just this one little uh, girl, a nine-year-old who we worked with earlier this year. So she came in profoundly blind um, her mother brought her into the hospital against the wishes of her husband, against the wishes of her village elders. Um, but she said, no, I'm going to make sure that my daughter gets treated. She came to the hospital. The surgery went very well. And here's one of my favorite videos. Her name is Sarika. So this was after the surgery. <laughs> So 
It's one of my favorite videos because both the children that you see here have been treated through Project Prakash. So the boy that you see was treated seven years ago, and Sarika has been treated just about 10 days before this. So it's, it's a silly question, but the question is, um, among accidental falls, the, 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 do you see more in the sighted people or the blind? <laughs> <laughs> the blind people are more cautious. Yeah, if I had shown you this, uh, so we have some other videos. The blind children typically have a shuffling gait. They walk without lifting their feet. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it, it slows down life a lot for them. Um, in order to, be, to stay safe, they have to take support of, of things. So they can't walk uh, as fast, they certainly can't run, which yeah, yeah. has all kinds of health ramifications. But thankfully, they don't suffer too many faults while they're blind. Um, so that kind of being witness to the infusion of joy in the lives of these children, that has just been remarkably uh, satisfying, and it changes us every time we see that. Um, we also see the expression of creativity in these children. So these are four Prakash children who have made this painting. We have now a program called Unruly Art, where we have the Prakash children come back to the hospital and engage in a day of just art. Um, and they derive so much pleasure from it, and we derive so much pleasure from it, just seeing them get experience with colors and, uh, and forms. In fact, we had an exhibition of some of the unruly art uh, at Princeton University earlier this year. That, that went off very well. And of course, uh, even the bigger thing of self-reliance. So over the years, over the months and years after surgery, it's wonderful to see these lives flourish, to see these children who Prior to the surgery, we needed so much help, even just to cross the road, to begin to, to, to develop their own independence. It's one of the best things one, one experiences. So these kinds of outcomes, none of these would have been possible had we not had the good fortune of seeing this opportunity for merging a, a humanitarian mission with the, with the scientific quest. Um, either one of them alone would probably not have been as effective as the two together. So there are tremendous benefits to be gained, and I hope Project Prakash is an example of that, tremendous benefits to be gained by putting these two worlds together, the world of the heart and the world of the mind, the compassion-driven world of the heart and the curiosity-driven world of the mind. We bring them together and great things can happen. Uh, you can benefit both of them. A sentiment that your, high, your holiness, you have stated so very eloquently when you have said, an open heart is an open mind. Thank you very much. On. We have a few minutes for uh, discussion. I know you had a, a couple of specific questions that um, you wanted to ask, so maybe yeah. we can get in a question before the end. So this is a, a fairly broad question, Your Holiness. Um, so science is, is uh, treated as a dispassionate activity, a dispassionate investigation into how the world works. And compassion, uh, by its very definition, is all about being passionate about the welfare of the other person. So how do you think we can change the mindsets in the world to make sure that when we talk about compassionate science, it's an enterprise that people take seriously. People understand that by bringing in compassion, into science, we are not diminishing either enterprise, but rather enhancing both of them. 
beautiful project that you presented, although one of the motivation may be seeing a scientific opportunity to do some research on a particular this question. Horrible. So that's in some sense a secondary motive. And then the primary motive is you see an opportunity to really help these children who are born blind. I think if our main aim is scientific research, then I think while a child still murdered the womb, is to make blind, <laughs> then carry more <laughs> for the research. <laughs> that never yeah. done. So that means, you see, there is some kind of, I said, these activities, actions, which serving other people, helping other people, try to reduce suffering, or try to become more successful or normal human being, that itself, you see, action of karuna, Compassion. Yeah. Huh? Compassion. Yeah. Oh, compassion. Yeah. Uh, so, see, we are not talking compassion is very important for next life. That's a religious sort of uh, uh, concept. Matter, um, <laughs> we simply, you see, tending, because uh, of that, because of trying uh, to promote uh, more sense of compassion in order to build healthy world happier world. So I think use common sense. Yep. When we saw newspaper or television killing, oh, this is murdering, we feel uncomfortable. You see, now, so now I think the, the, even the United Nations level, you see, try is their best to reduce these things. Then you see sometimes they, there's no other option except to use violence because of the force. force. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a temporary method. Long run, you see, we have to deal. The real source of violence is here. So since we do not want uh, more suffering or violence, then pray, prayer to God old method, <laughs> when we uh, are not much sort of active, then sitting, pray, 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 pray. <laughs> 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 now, with help of technology, now, uh, and realistic, so we have to build healthy, healthy world, happy world through action. Yes. So that's a compassionate action. So I think everybody is want a happier world. Yep. And even selfish. You see, you are part of the humanity. If humanity happy, peace, you get automatically benefit. Mm -hmm. Something like world burning. You till you see the fire reach your own because of the body, you remain relaxed. It's foolish. Sooner or later, you also will suffer. So you have to, 
You have to actively get involved in the that. effort. Yeah. Yeah. So through education, not through meditation, not through prayer, not through ritual. No. By Indian, most, many of Indian gurus, they did not much pay attention about this knowledge, but rather just to pray, pray, yeah. uh, and ritual. Yep. <laughs> so transformation of millions of poor Indian, uh, not through prayer, but through government sort of plan. So that's obvious. So now, when we talk compassion, is to try to bring enthusiasm to carry such work. That's compassion, isn't it? I, I completely agree. So you use yeah. common sense. Yeah. Then most important, the scientific finding. Mm -hmm. This this morning, I just simply you see, mentioned, you see, including this scientist. You see, they uh, now they carry some sort of presentation. I, I think I may have mentioned here. I, I think you mentioned, you see, very, very young infant child, language not yet developed. Then show some cartoon. Uh, one cartoon show sort of the because of the uh, uh, behavior. Because of behavior out of affection. Another certain sort of activities, a certain behavior uh, with negative emotion, don't care, or some kind of sort of even harming, harming, harming other. So the infant child, mm -hmm. is when seeing that a uh, uh, more affectionate sort of action, the child smile, feel happy. The negative cartoon, you see, seeing. So they concluded basic human nature is more compassionate. That's quite true. We born from our mother. Uh, mm -hmm. When mother, you see, show affection, if child, you see, not accept that affection, then we'll die. So seven billion human beings now survived because of that affection. That's because of that, I think that affection, experience, I think, in our blood. So therefore, now, now scientists, they say, constant fear, anger, very bad for our health. More compassionate mind brings inner strength, self-confidence. It is quite so. I think, use common sense, it is very clear. For example, here, if I is too much concerned about my own name or something, then automatically you see bring some kind of anxiety or something. Then it's a pretension. Then you see you cannot sort of carry kasati mint transparently or transparent. Without transparency, difficult to develop trust. Trust come you, when you carry your life transparent. In order to carry transparent, you should be honest, truthful. Truthful, honest, very much depend on warm-heartedness, respect other, consider other as a human brother, sisters. So these are, use common sense, not talking about Buddha's word or something. Common sense. Of course, those people who are very seriously concerned about next life, then, of course, we need some other practice. <laughs> <laughs> but seven billion human beings, including non-believer, out of seven billion, over one billion non-believer. And frankly speaking, among the believer also, a lot of troublemaker. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so lack of moral principle. So, you see, that, uh, in the past, is it through prayer, through sort of spiritual, religious sort of the Approaches. teaching, no. is it try to uh, cultivate and try to maintain like that. Now that more or less uh, will not cover whole seven million human beings. Now education is the key factor. Uh, so now here the scientific 
finding. It's the real sort of basis of our sort of dakhasure. Effort, love. Yeah. Yeah. Explanation. No? Yeah. So usually I, uh, I sort of, I, I believe, and also it's a telling, there are common experience, we all come from our mother, we all uh, survived with mother's milk. Oh, recently I heard, you see, uh, through BBC, in mother's milk, See, they, uh, according to the sort of the requirement, the young child, you see, first week, second week, first month, second month, third month, you see, physical develop. Changes. So accordingly, it's just some different sort of Lighting. chemicals is necessary. Right. So that mother's milk, biologically or by nature, you see, develop that according to the requirement of the child's because of that. Needs. Uh, certain need, uh, needs. Certain potential, right? Needs. Needs, like that. So this is wonderful. This is wonderful. Nature, mm -hmm. I think we have to worship nature, Absolutely. I feel. Yeah. So science, <laughs> simply, you see, trying to understand the nature. Great. That's very good. Yeah. No. Sometimes, I'm a religious person, of course. But sometimes we a little bit exaggerated <laughs> beyond nature. <laughs> like that. So our common sense and common experience and scientific finding. These are the basis to make awareness and a conviction the rest of the seven billion human beings. Not our present generation, next generation. Yep. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. In fact, your point about education, it's very close to my heart. Mm. If I have one minute, I want to show yes. a very tiny video clip that's related to just one minute. Um, so, so looking forward, what is Project Prakash going mm. to do? So far, we have merged medical care with scientific research, but we find that there's one piece that's still needing attention, and this little girl kind of exemplifies what that piece is. So this, her name is Hemwati. We treated her, uh, her vision post-surgery was very good. And here's a little interview, I'll play just about 30 seconds of that interview, of me talking to her after her treatment. Um, so I'm asking her, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she says, doctor. And I ask her, what kind of doctor? And she says, an ophthalmic doctor, so that I can do for other children hmm? what you have done for me. And I was so happy to, to hear this. But then, two years later, when I was again in India and I inquired about Hemwati, it turned out that she had gotten married. So she is 14 at the time this video was made. So in, within two years after this, so like at the age of 15 or so, the parents got her married, and she's now expecting a child. So her educational journey that would have enabled her to, to aspire to becoming a doctor, to doing some great things in her life, that didn't even start. And what we feel we need to do is to make efforts on our own to bring in that educational component. So immediately after these children are treated and they have sight, we need to give them the resources so that they can begin using their vision for acquiring an education and then improving their chances in life and also improving their ability to make a positive impact on the rest of the world. So that's the, the third piece that we want to bring in over the course of the coming yes. years. Research, health care, education. And education. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, and not mere education. Is education aiming is promote these basic human Qualities. human quality? Mm -hmm. That also very important for healthcare. Very much so, indeed. So it's a research not only expand our knowledge, mm -hmm. but is a how to bring happier world, seven million human beings, happy home. Yes, I think we can do. I think education really transformed humanity on this planet, yep. isn't it? Yes. Now, you see, we reach second level, you see, through education, 
transform more compassionate humanity. In order to create more compassionate human being, start from individual, not say, some government level or something. You see, I think B like bottom up. Huh? Bottom, bottom up. up. Bottom up. Or he, or your favorite Kasa. Your expression. <laughs> your you favorite say. expression. <laughs> 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 That's actually, you see, our Buddhist sort of tradition also like that, from this level, uh, bring wow. to Buddhahood. Yeah. <laughs> so, Kaza. Bottom up. Ka. Bottom up. Bottom up. <laughs> well, I think our time has come to a close. I wanted to just make a couple of very brief announcements. Uh, just when we end today at 3 o'clock in front of the oh, hall, yes. uh, there will be a special event, a monastic debate. Yes. on science topics that are put on by the Sarah J. Science Center. Tea will be served outside. And then this evening, at 7 p.m. this evening, here in this main hall, uh, Wendy Hessenkamp, our own Wendy from Mind and Life, will be giving uh, what I'm sure will be a fantastic lecture on science and uh, neuroscience as it pertains to this whole area. So those of you who have not uh, had a lot of background in this area. This is a wonderful opportunity. And at 6 o'clock this evening, uh, at Sarah May, there will be a discussion in Tibetan in the main prayer hall uh, on His Holiness's book, uh, The Universe in a Single Atom. Uh, and so uh, all are welcome to either of those events. Uh, and I'm finally, I'd like to just end by thanking Pavan so much for your wonderful contributions. due to his sort of sense of concern or sort of compassionate activities, a uh, lot of uh, sorry, liber, liber, leprosy, lep, uh, uh, person who have the leprosy. You see, about, I think, I think about 2,000, or about 2,000. You see, they, because of the, the people who really take care so you see, they eventually develop self-confidence. They physical, uh, self-dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, self-dignity. Self and they, you see, become some kind of productive community. Uh, and I visited, you see, the, some people using their hand, you see, because of their illness, you see, uh, some, you see, uh, because of that. Uh, uh, but loss of fingers? Uh, sort of full of confidence. You see, they carry it's a certain, even you see one, one finger you see, doing something. I so much sort of impressed. So then at that time, fortunately, Nobel Prize. Uh, so I got some sort of money. So as soon as I announced, I heard that announcement, and immediately I make up in my, my mind some portion of that money. To, 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 to donate that. So I want to make some donation. Uh, See oh. what? <laughs> really wonderful. Wonderful. When I saw, when I saw the picture, is it blind? Uh, I really feel very sad. Nearly tear, tear come. But then after open, you see, their eye become smiling. Then that gives me also, you see. So really wonderful work, really wonderful work. Thank you very much.